Hi, I'm Ben Jacobin. In today's Treehouse workshop, we're going to look at using parse.com as the backend for a simple Android app. We're going to build a very simple social bookmarking app. And while the app itself isn't anything special, parse.com is. Let's take a look at the website and see some of the features they offer. So if you visit parse.com and click on the Products tab, they have a list of some of their offerings. Parse.com is basically a backend as a service. And if you haven't heard of that term, what that means is it is the web component for your mobile apps. Everything you need from cloud data storage, uh, push notifications, social framework integration. And they also have something called cloud code, which is a way to put your business logic in the cloud as a layer between your app and the data that you're going after. And finally, if we scroll down to the bottom, we see that parse.com is available for all these different platforms. So we can use parse.com as the backend for all of these different clients. So for today's workshop, we're going to concentrate on the parse data product. All right, so here we have listed the features that we're going to utilize from parse.com. We will create users and then log them in and out of our app. We will add relationships between users, which means a user can follow other users, like in Twitter. We'll save custom data to the web, and we'll retrieve that custom data and display it in our app. So all of the code we write today will be available for download on this video page. Now, I'm going to copy and paste some blocks of code, and while I'll talk about them here in the workshop, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or post a question in our Treehouse forum. Okay, so back at parse.com. To sign up for a new account, whether you're on the home page or anywhere else, you can click on this sign up button here. And you don't need much information. All right, so let me just add a few fields here. Name is Ben. I'll use a fake email address from Treehouse here. And click on the sign up button. Or you can see at the bottom, you have the option to log in with your GitHub account. Now here you need a name for your app and your company. So for the app name, we'll just say it's the Treehouse Workshop. Company type. Doesn't really matter for this. We'll just say we're a startup. Company name, Treehouse, and job title, Teacher. Okay, so click on Start Using Parse. All right, so here we end up on the welcome screen. And if you scroll down a little bit, you can see they have a few different quick start guides. Now, like I said, we're going to use the cloud data product from Parse. So let's click on this quick start guide. And this has a step-by-step -step process for how to get a simple project template up and running. So we're going to build an Android project. And if you want to integrate into an existing project, you can. However, we're going to start a new project. Okay, the Parse app is the one that we just defined. And here it says to download and install the SDK. This is the parse.com SDK. So if we click on this download link, and then open it up in Finder, all right, here's the project template we're going to use. I can import that right into Eclipse. So here in Eclipse, import. And this is an existing project. Click Next. Here I can browse to my download directory. This is the Parse Starter project that we just downloaded. Click Open. Make sure this Copy Projects into Workspace is checked. And click Finish. OK. And we have a few errors here. We'll get to those shortly. But let's go back and take a look at the Quick Start Guide that we were working through. OK, so here. These are step-by-step -step instructions on how to import your project. Now, the last step here is to add the client ID and application ID in the onCreate method for your application. And what this means is we want to copy and paste this line of code into our project. So open up the parse application.java file. This is where we have the error. And you can see we have the error because it does not have a correct application or client ID. So if I delete this line and paste in the one from the web, I hit Command-Shift-F to format my code and save, and now our errors are gone. Okay, we're almost there. Let's go back here. Okay, and scroll down a little bit. And step number four is to actually test the SDK from our project. So now we want to copy and paste these three lines also in the onCreate method of that application class. So back in Eclipse, down here at the bottom, paste in those three lines. And what they do is they create a parse object variable. It's named test object, and it adds data in a key value pair. The key here is foo, the value is bar, and it calls the save in background method from the parse APIs. We'll take a look at this in just a moment, but let's just organize our imports, save the project, and run it in the emulator. 
Okay, so once we get this screen in the emulator, that means that our project ran successfully. And it also means behind the scenes that it created some test data and stored it on parse.com with this save and background method. Let's switch back to our quick start guide. Okay, and here our last step is to click on the test button here. This does the check and says, yes, we did get our data and save our first object. So if we scroll down, it says, to uh, continue learning the SDK, we can dive into the documentation or use the dashboard to start looking at apps and their data. Let's actually click on that first because here we can actually look at the data that we just saved. So in the dashboard, you want to select the data browser. And here we can see the test object class and it has some information that was generated for it. But you can see the foo key and the bar value that we added in the onCreate method. Here it was created on today's date and time. And it has a few other fields that are automatically generated. So what makes parse.com really exciting for cloud data storage is you don't need to define any kind of data schema ahead of time. You define your data in your code, and then when you save it to parse.com, it formats it into this table automatically. So you just add your keys and values in key value pairs, and it creates an object automatically. It creates its own relationships if needed, and it takes care of everything for you. Okay, so if I go back to the quick start guide, the other link at the bottom of the quick start guide was for the documentation. That same link is here. So if I click on that, I can see that there's a bunch of documentation for all the different platforms. They have both detailed developer guides as well as API reference guides. Okay, back in Eclipse, I want to copy some of this code from the onCreate method, and we're going to paste it into my sample project and continue from there. So I'm going to copy these lines because they contain our application and client keys close up the parse starter project, and switch over to the Treehouse Parse Workshop. So what we have here is the general classes, activities, and layouts we need for our simple social bookmarking app. And we need to set those IDs in the Parse Workshop application file. So just like before, this file is extending the Android application class. And here we have the onCreate method where we add our parse initialization code. So let's clean this up just a little bit. We don't need this comment. Here are the IDs we need. Now here is a line that enables automatic users. This is for when we're not going to have specific user functionality where we log in and out. This will, however, cause problems if you have this line and authenticated users turned on. So we need to delete this line so that we can add our own users in just a few minutes. And you'll notice I didn't copy and paste that test code that created the test object because we don't care about that every time we run this app. All right, so let's just save these changes and let's talk a little bit about this app so that you know what we're building. If I open up the layouts, that'll give us an idea of how it actually looks and then we can work within the activities that correspond to each layout. So when our app first starts, we'll present the user with a page to log in or sign up. And here it just has the Treehouse logo, sign up button, and a login button. So the first time the user is using our app, they can use the sign up button and it will create an account and we'll write some code for that. And then when they come back, they can log in instead. So let's briefly talk about the code we have already here. In the onCreate method, we're just getting references to the login button and the sign up button. And depending on which button was tapped, we want to proceed to the next activity with the type of the button that was tapped. We have the type defined up here as either login or sign up and we'll see these are used down below. This first block here on line 32, it says that we're checking for a cache user using the method parseuser.getCurrentUser. Uh, we'll come back to this because right now we don't have any user information in our app at all. So let's just proceed with user creation and then we'll come back and revisit logging in and cached users. So for the sign up button, here we can see the on click listener and it's taking us to the next activity, authenticate activity, and it has a key value pair attached to the intent. The key is type and the actual value is sign up. Here notice for login that the actual type would be login. Okay, and we're not going to add any code to this activity right now, but instead let's open up authenticate activity and take a look at how to sign up a user there. So once again, we have some standard Android code to get references to fields on the authentication activity. And let's look at the layout as well. This is just a standard login page with email address and password and a button that says login, although the button text will get changed to sign up when the user is signing up for the first time. So back in the code, 
You can see the button has one on click listener. And if it's a sign up, we're going to sign up using parse user. Otherwise, we'll log in using parse user. So let's switch back to the parse documentation. Because here, if we click in the Android guide, we can see there's a users section. And this details how the parse user object is used. So this has the information about how users are stored on the back end, how we can use them. And it also has some sample code that we can use in our app. So here, if we scroll down to the signing up section, you can see the code to illustrate a typical signup. And there are more options that you can add here, and you can read up on the guide or the API documentation for that. But this will suit our purposes just fine. So let me copy this code and paste it here in the signup block. Now, there's a few things we don't need here. Right now, we're not going to do anything like an other field with a phone number. So let's get rid of that. And we're not going to set the email because we're using email as the username. So we just want username and password. Now, the username and password are available from the edit text fields. And they're here as string variables. So I can just substitute those, username for set username, and password for set password. And then we call the user.signupInBackground method. Now, the way the parse.com APIs are structured, all of these methods have that in background appended at the end. What that means is our app makes the call, it goes off and does all its work in the background, which means our app remains responsive to the user. They can touch it and do whatever they want. Then when the operation is finished on the parse.com backend, it comes back and it uses a callback mechanism to call back into the Android code where we can resume processing. So this callback here is the done method, and it passes in an optional parse exception, and that just indicates whether it was successful or not. So if it was successful, the exception here will be null, and that means we can go in and proceed with the app. Otherwise, there was some kind of failure, and we can look at the parse exception object that was returned to figure out what went wrong. Okay, so I'm going to paste some code in here. One thing I want to point out is this page is using a progress indicator, a progress bar, and it gets started when the call is made. You can see here the visibility is set to visible. We want to make sure we hide that progress bar when the callback is called. So I'm going to cut these lines here, paste in my own. Here we hide the progress bar. And then here, if it was successful, we're going to start the next activity, which is called the main feed activity. And for this, we just have simple error handling that says it's a toast that says the signup failed, try again. I'll hit Control Shift F to format my code. Save. And now at this point, we can run the app and make sure that we're actually able to sign up. So let's click on the Run button and view it in the emulator. Okay, here's our parse signup screen. Click on the Sign Up button and we're taken to the Authenticate activity. And here we can see that the login text hasn't changed. So there's something wrong there, but for now, let's just try and see if we can sign up. Add my very secure password here and click on login. And right now the code we have for main feed activity doesn't do anything. It starts the spinner, but it's not really making any calls. But that's okay. What we want to do is look on the back end, back in our parse.com dashboard. So I'll just open up a new tab for the dashboard over here. So if you're coming back to parse.com, you can see that I'm logged in here and on this drop down, there's a link for the dashboard. Okay, and once again, if we click on the data browser, we can take a look at the data for our app. And this time we have a user table, which has our new user that we just signed up. So all we have is a username and password. We don't have any other email or other information. Now this first row here, this is the anonymous user that was there from the original template project. So I can just clean up right here within the, the uh, data browser. I can check the row and click on delete row. And now we just have one user in our app. So let's go back to the Android developer guide on parse.com. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can get to the logging in section. So let's tackle that next. And this is very similar to signing up, although we don't need to create the data this time. Instead, we just need to send the username and password to parse.com using the login in background method. So once again, I'm going to copy this code here as it will suit our purposes. And back in our authenticate activity, let's add this down here in the login block. In here, we can use the same username and password string variables from before.
And you can see that when the login background method returns, it's using a new login callback, which also calls a method called done. Once again, I'm going to paste in some code to take us to the main feed activity and also to display a little toast in case anything fails. And we also are going to dismiss the progress bar up here on line 76. All right, so if I hit Command Shift F, I can auto format the code, save it. And now if we run the app again, we'll be able to log in with that user account that we just created. Okay, so it's loading. Okay, so here we're back at the sign up slash login screen. Now if we click on the login button, we're again taken to the login page. Here we can add our email address, super secure password, and click login. And like before, we're taken to the main screen. And if we go back to our data browser, we can see that we still have one row here for the same user, ben at teamtreehouse.com. Okay, so let's take one more look at the Android guide for users. If we scroll down just a little bit more, we can see the current user section talks about how parse.com caches the current user on disk. So you can treat this cache as a session, and we can use this to automatically log the user in the next time they start the app. So that's where this parseuser.getCurrentUser method comes into play. So let me copy this code here. And back in our login or sign up activity, up here is where we're first going to check to see if the user's logged in. So what we're doing here is if the user logs in, leaves the app, and then comes back, that user information is cached. We can check it, and if it's still there, proceed and take the user right into the app rather than ask them to log in once again. So the get current user method returns a user object. And if the user object is there, that means the, the information was cached. If it's not, it returns null. So if we add a null check, if it's not null, that means that we're logged in, cached, and we can proceed to main feed activity. Okay, so let's save this and run it. And now, rather than seeing that initial signup screen, we should be taken right into the main feed itself. Okay, and there we are. The main feed is just going to spin there until we do something with it, but we skip the login screen. Okay, let's do one more thing with users. Let's add the functionality for logging out. So up here in the action bar, I have a logout menu choice. And right now, if you tap on it, it takes you back to the login screen, but because the current user is still cached, it automatically forwards you back in. So it doesn't do anything right now. Back in the user guide, we can see we can clear the current user by logging them out, and that's with the parseUser.logout method. So all we need to do is add this to that logout option that we just tapped. So that is here in main feed activity. And it's in the menu for the action bar. That uses the on option item selected method. And here I've got an add button, a follow button, and the logout button. Here is where we want to call the parseUser.logout method. Now the user will be cleared from cache and then will be taken to the login or sign up activity class. So let's save this and run it and verify that this is working as well. Okay, so we're back in the main feed activity. We're logged in to log out. Let's tap on the menu choice. And now we're back at the sign up screen. So before we go any further, I'm just going to add a few extra users so that we can add some relationships between the users. So I'll just pick a few other Treehouse teachers. Log out and sign up a few more. Okay, so if we switch over to our data browser once again, now we can see all the users that I just added. We've got five different users, and that way, when we start adding relationships between the users, we can have people actually follow each other. Okay, so right now everything's set with users, and when we get to that main feed activity, there's the spinner that just spins, and there's no data to display. So we need to be able to add some data, and then retrieve it and display it. Let's take a look at how to add data first. So up here in the action bar, we have a button to add a new link. And if I tap on that, we're taken to a new activity, the add a link activity. 
And you can type or paste in a URL and add a few notes and then click Save. So let's take a look at that add link activity. And here in the on create, we are getting references to the different views on the screen. And the save button has an on-click listener, so then we tap on it, we get the URL, we get the notes, make sure that the URL has a value, and we're going to save the parse object. Finally, we'll call the finish method on this activity to take the user back to the main feed activity. So how do we save a parse object? Well, let's take a look at the documentation. So here in the Android guide, the very first topic is called objects. And just like I was saying before, the parse objects are generated dynamically. So however you define the key value pairs, that's how your data will be saved in the cloud. So if we scroll down a little bit to the saving objects, we can see some example code on how to save a high score for a player. So the first thing we need to do is declare a parse object variable. Then we put our data into it in key value pairs, and then we call the save in background method. All right, let's do that here. So we start with a parse object, and we'll name this a post equals a new parse object. We use the constructor. Now this is the name that will show up for the, uh, basically for the table that we'll see in the data browser. So I already have a constant defined called posts. And if I scroll up to the top here, I see that posts just equals post. So, okay, so now let's add a little bit of data to it. We have a URL and a notes field that we want to save. So let's add those using the put method. So we say post.put. And here in the content assist, we can see that the string key and the object value get added in. So the first key, I have the keys defined as constants as well. So type key underscore URL, and we'll pass in the URL as the second parameter. Then we'll do the same thing, post put key notes, and we'll pass in the notes string as the second parameter there. And finally, we're ready to save, so we call post.save in background. And you can see here as well in Content Assist, there are a few different save methods. Save eventually, save in background with a different callback. And these allow you to do different types of saves. So if you want to batch up your all, all the data you want to save, you can do that. Or if you want to save without any callback mechanism. Um, in this case, we're not going to use a callback mechanism. So I'm going to select this one here, add a semicolon, and save. So let's run it and test it out. Okay, so once again, main activity isn't showing anything, but if I tap on the Add button and add a URL, add some notes, and click Save. So the activity is finished. We go back to the main activity, and let's take a look in the Parse data browser to see if our data was actually saved. So I'll just hit Refresh. And here, over in the left, we have a new class called post. Remember, that was the constant string that I defined in the activity. And here you can see the number says we have one entry. So if I click on post, we can see there's our one entry. It has a notes field, the URL, and a few other auto-generated fields. Now every class, every object in Parse gets an auto-generated object ID. And we can use this to uh, refer to different objects, to relate them to each other. That's automatically generated for us, much like a, a key is generated in a database table. All right, once again, I'm going to add a few more URLs in here for test data, and then we'll take a look at how to retrieve and display those URLs in the main activity. Okay, so let's switch back over to the Android Developer Guide. And now that we are done saving objects, let's look at how to retrieve objects. Retrieving is done using a parse object known as a parse query. The query object calls the get in background method, and it passes in uh, different types of parameters. We can pass in an object ID, which we just saw, if we happen to know the specific object ID, or we can run more generalized queries to search for things or get different types of relations. We can also add different parameters to the parse query object. Let's switch over to the parse query API because we're going to use a different method that isn't there in the documentation. So if I click on the Android API, over here on the left, I can find parse query. And this has a detailed documentation about how to use the parse query object. 
And if I come down here to the method summary, I want to use the find in background method because this retrieves a list of parse objects that satisfy this query. Okay, and then once this returns, it calls a find callback, and we can use that to then display the list in our main activity. Okay, so let's switch over to main feed activity. And here we've got the shell in place once again. And down here we have a get latest posts method where we're going to add our code. So this happens, this gets called in the on resume of the activity. And the reason we do this is that way the list is always refreshed whenever the activity is resumed. So if we add a new link and come back, on resume gets called and we'll get the latest post, which should include the new link that we added. So we start with defining a parse query variable. And for the parse query constructor, we need to pass in the name of the object or the class that we're looking for. So back in our data browser, remember that the object we're after is called post. It's basically, a, you can think of this as the, the name of this table of data. So rather than type in post, though, I can use that same constant from the add link activity. So here we called it posts, add a semicolon. And now I'm going to paste in a little bit of code to do the find in background, and we'll talk about what this is actually doing. Okay, so here we're calling query.find in background, and we're defining the find callback here as the parameter. Once again, the name of the callback method is done, just like we saw with the users. And here we return a list of parse objects called results, and also an optional parse exception. So the first line, once again, we're using a progress bar. This will dismiss it so that we won't see that spinning uh, circle any longer. And just like with the users, we are checking to see if the exception is null or not. Uh, if it is null, then everything was successful and we can proceed with processing the list of results. If it was not null, then we want to analyze that parse exception somehow. But right now, all we have in this app is just a simple log. We need a parenthesis to close off the find and background method. Okay. So what's going on here when we're successful? Uh, what we have is an array list of hash map values. It's all strings. And basically, it's a list of articles. Remember that each article has a URL and a uh, notes field. Okay, if I hit Command Shift F, then my code gets organized so we can read it a little more easily. All we're doing is, is we're taking this list of results and we're looping through. And for every result, we're creating a hash map variable called an article. We're adding the notes value from the result, as well as the URL value for the result. We're reusing the same constants from add link activity. That way they're just defined in one place. And we're adding the article hash map to the array list of articles. <laughs> the reason we're going through all of this is so that we can use a list adapter. Actually, we're using a simple adapter to adapt these pieces of data for viewing in a list. The code down here declares the adapter, uses the articles as the data source, uses a simple list item 2 layout from the Android SDK, and it maps the notes in the URL to the different text fields from the layout. If you want more information about how all of this works, you can check out the Build a Blog Reader app as we talk about this in detail. Finally, we call set list adapter, and let's just take a look and see, and that should make everything make sense. Okay, and this time you saw that the progress bar was spinning for just a second as we called out to parse.com. Once the data was returned, it called that done method, and since it was successful, it adapted the data for display here in the list. Our activity also creates code, an on list item click listener to take the URL from each item and pass it to the browser. So if we tap on one of the list items, it will open it in the default browser. And the last thing we're going to talk about is the ability to follow users. So right now, it's hidden here in the action bar as the follow option. So if we click on follow, it'll take us to a new activity, and it's going to query the users table that we were looking at, pull back all the users, remove ourselves from the list, uh, because we 
We don't want to create any loops where we follow ourselves. And then it's going to display it in a list that we can tap to check users that we want to follow. Now, before we get into following users, I do want to add one thing here to our query object. I want to show that you can add different parameters to the query variable before calling the find in background method. So let's imagine that our app gets really popular and we've got millions of different URLs added to the site all the time. Uh, we want to be able to limit this query because we don't want to pull back everything from the table. So you can use the query.setLimit method. You can see the int parameter is the new limit. So in this case, let's just pass in uh, 100 articles as our limit. There are a lot of different methods we can use like this. And once again, you can refer to the parse query API documentation. Another one I found useful is uh, similar to what you might see in a SQL database uh, with an order by clause. You can use order by ascending or order by descending. So let's change ours to order by the descending creation time. And here, this is the string key. And if you switch over to the data browser for post, you can pick any of these columns. Let's choose the created at column. So back here, we'll just add created at as the string parameter. And now we will have the top 100 posts sorted by the creation date in reverse order. Okay, so now let's take a look at how to select users and add the following relationship. So here in the select users activity, uh, it's similar to what we had in the main feed activity. So here we have a get all users method, and we're going to use a query object. However, we're not going to create it using the parse query constructor. Instead, we're going to get it from the parse user object. We're going to call the get query method. So let's take a look at, at how it works. So we have a parse query variable again, and again, we'll name it query. But this time it equals parse user dot get query. This gets us a query associated with the user. So now we're going to call the find and background method again using this query object. And I'm going to paste in the code. And here I'm using the same order by descending so that the new newest users will appear at the top of the list. We call query.findInBackground. It's using the find callback mechanism. Once again, it's named done. We'll dismiss the progress bar. And the error case, if something went wrong, it's just a simple toast to say there was an error getting the users. But if it was successful, what we want to do is we want to take the list of parse objects and format it for view. We also want to remove ourselves from the list because we don't want to create those loops. So I've got a helper method called remove current user. So if we scroll down there, we see that remove current user just loops through all of the objects. Since the object ID is unique for every single object in the parse backend, so each user has an object ID, each other object has an object ID, our current user object ID, which you can see is this code over here, can be compared to the get object ID from each user in the list. So if there's a match, then we just remove that user from the list and return the now smaller list back to where it was called from. This part here, getting user relationships, that's what I wanted to talk about because this is slightly different than what we saw with a regular query. Okay, so what does this mean exactly, a parse relation? Well, let's take a look at the user guide once again. Here in the Android guide, under the objects section, we want to click on relational data. And this is Parse's way of relating objects in the back end to each other. So basically how it works is any parse object can be related to any other parse object. You simply add one object to the other using the same put method with a key value pair. In this case, the value is the object that you want to relate to. So in our code, right now we're getting user relations, but we haven't established any yet. That actually needs to be done first so that we can see how it works. So in this app, that kind of relationship is established in the user's adapter. Let's start there and then we'll come back to this get user relations code. So in the user's adapter, this is just a custom adapter that extends a basic array adapter, but it's adapting parse objects and it creates a layout that has the parse username, a checkbox for whether or not you follow that user, and I also threw in an image that looks and sees if there's a gravatar associated with the email address for that user. But what we really care about are, is the relationships down here. So when the checkbox is checked, we need to add a relationship. 
and when it's unchecked, we want to delete that relationship. So that's all done down here. Set on click listener, and if it's checked, we call update relationship. We pass in true because we want to add the relationship, and if it's false, we want to delete the relationship. So let's take a look at that method. Update relationship, and to see the second parameter is called should add. So true for whether or not we should add, false if we should delete. Okay, so I'm going to once again paste in some sample code and then just talk through how it's working. So we're using the same parse user object from before like we saw when we were signing up and logging in. And here we're getting the current user because that's how we want that's who we want to add the relationship to. So now we're using the parse relation object and we're taking the current user and we call get relation and we're passing in a constant here. Relation is just defined as a string. It's called user relation. And again, since parse is dynamic, this is something that we are generating on the fly. So if it's there, it's going to get the relation for us. And if it's not there, it will create it. Then if it's adding the relation, all we need to do is call the add method. So user relation, we want to add to this user. And we're also adding to a local array of user relations that we're using in our adapter. Again, if you have any questions about this code, if you're looking at it after the fact, please feel free to contact me or post a question in the Treehouse forum. For removal, we call the userRelation.remove method, and we just remove the user, and parse takes care of getting the correct object ID and removing the relation. And this loop down here is simply removing it from the local array as well. Okay, lastly, we save the current user with the save in background method, and that just saves the relation itself. So we can see it in action if we save this code, and I may as well save this one while we're at it, and then run, and we should be able to add users now. So if we click follow, it goes out and retrieves the list of current users, drops in their emails. You see that my own information is removed from the list. And now if I check on the box, it calls that update relationship method. And I'll go ahead and follow everybody. And now we can verify in the data browser. And I, I think that helps illustrate exactly how it's working. So if we go to the data browser and refresh, now within our user table, we see that there's a new user relation column. So this is the one that we added. We, we defined this name user relation. And if we click on view relations, it gives us a list of all the relations for that current user. Now the one I clicked on didn't have any relations because I clicked on Allison here at the top. But if I go to my row and I click on view relations, since I'm the one who logged in, you can see that all four users that I checked now appear here in my user relation like subgroup here. And if I uncheck two of them, come back here and refresh, they've been saved in the background and now only the two remaining ones are here in the table. Okay, so one more time, how is that working here in the select users activity? Because this is, we kind of skipped over this code to, to first add the relations. So now we're checking the relations and we're using that same parse relation object and we are getting the relation named user relation. So if you come back to the data browser, again, this is the user relation that's defined on this user object, and we can get a query object from the parse relation and call that familiar find in background method. And if we don't pass in any specific search parameters, then it's going to just return everything that matches. So it uses the same callback mechanism, it calls done, and here all we're doing is we're taking the list that's returned, it's a list of users, and we're adapting them using our custom user adapters. That's how they show up on the screen for us to check on. Okay, so we've really just scratched the surface with what you can do with parse.com, but hopefully you can see that it's fairly straightforward and, and quick and easy to get up and running and do some pretty cool stuff with a web background for your mobile app. Now, if you go in and sign up for an account, you can take a look at the documentation. You can see what else you're capable of doing. And also take a look at the different products available from parse.com because we just looked at the cloud data storage, but like I mentioned before, there are push notifications, social network integration, and a few other things that are really interesting. So, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or contact us in the Treehouse Forum. 
Check out teamtreehouse.com for more Android tutorials, and we'll see you next time.